Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Lighthouse. Today's Ash Wednesday. It marks the first day of Lent, that 40-day period of reflection and prayer and confession and repentance. Today is also the day that we're starting a new eight-week series uh, together called Letting Go. Over the next 40-ish days or so, we'll cover a lot of ground, but one of the truths that will be our guiding light is this. Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn, but to save. And because of his sacrifice and his love and acceptance, we can let go of all of the sin and the shame that seeks to enslave us. So if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed, right? So let's start, please, with a word of prayer. Create in us a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast us away, but take your, Holy, or take your Holy Spirit from us, but restore to us the joy of our salvation. We pray in this, in, in the name of Jesus, amen. So Lent is, it's a time for us to assess ourselves and to make adjustments, right? It's a time for us to recalibrate to God's way of living and loving. And the purpose of repentance and reflection is not to lay ourselves under condemnation, but to offer up ourselves for salvation. And this is very important. This will be our guiding light throughout this series. God did not send his son to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's, that's John three seventeen. So did you hear that, though? Jesus did not come to condemn us, but he came to save us. He wants to set us free. He did not come to merely set us free from the consequences of our sins, such as offering forgiveness only, but he came to set us free from the power of sin in our lives as well. And this means that those powerful forces that grab hold of us, things like fear and anxiety and lust and anger and greed and selfishness, they will lose their grip. Why? Because God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn those of us who struggle with fear and anxiety and lust and anger. God sent Jesus into the world to free us from fear and anxiety and lust and anger. And that kind of salvation is possible. That's what God wants for you. Do you know something else? Jesus came, do you know something else that Jesus came to save us from? Shallow religion. What do I mean by shallow religion? I mean a form of religion that's high on words and high on rules, but very low on inner transformation of the heart or the mind. Shallow religion, it doesn't affect us very deeply, and God wants to save us from that. He wants us to step, he wants to step into our lives. He wants, to step our li he wants us to step into a life of courage and self-giving love that will heal both ourselves and those around us. Shallow religion will never be courageous or self-giving. It will always be self-serving and based in fear. So today, this first day of Lent, we're gonna swim into the deeper waters of the teachings of Jesus. Our passage today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter six. This is part of Jesus's core teaching called the Sermon on the Mount, which we have uh, studied before in here where Jesus teaches us what life is like in his kingdom. This is what a saved life looks like. And this kind of life, it cannot emerge from a shallow type of religion. This kind of life is based on an inward transformation. Most of you know that I went to the Eco National Gathering this year, and the theme of that meeting time was a word called metanoia. It's a Greek word, metanoia, and it's usually translated in our Bibles as repentance. But it really has a much more expanded and nuanced definition than that, and we're gonna start unpacking that in the days to come in this series, but it has to do with transformation. It has to do with becoming, of changing. So think about that. Have that in the back of your mind as we begin to look at our passage tonight. 
As we said, it's Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 6, and then we're going to jump ahead a little bit to verses 16 through 21. So if you're able to stand for the reading of Scripture, please do so at this time. If you can't, then stay where you are. That's fine, too. Watch out. Don't do your do good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, do not do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received all the reward they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. When you pray... Don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, this is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. Then we're going to skip down a few lines and go through verses 16 through 21 now. And when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do, for they try to look miserable and disheveled so that people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, that is the only reward they will ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face. Then no one will notice that you are fasting except your Father, who knows what you do in private. And your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Word of the Lord. Praise be to God. You may be seated. All right, saved from shallow religion, that is what we're talking about. And Jesus gets right to the point in verse 1. He says, be careful or watch out. Do not practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. And then Jesus mentions three different spiritual practices, right? Giving and praying and fasting. And Jesus says right away that it is possible to do these practices in a way that is empty and shallow with no reward from our Father in heaven. So if we're going to spend time giving and praying and fasting, don't we want to do that in a way that is transformational instead? In a way that embodies that word that I mentioned, metanoia? So since we're heading into Lent, right, this is a time that we dedicate to practicing our righteousness, a time filled with opportunities to fast and to pray and to give. So we're going to look at these practices. We're going to look at these things, these practices of of giving and praying and fasting. These are core routines for all Christ followers. And when done properly and in the right spirit with the right expectations, they can have a tremendous impact on our relationship with God and our relationships with those around us. So it's important to note that doing these spiritual exercises as, as if to check them off of a, some kind of a spiritual to-do list, that's not the goal here. That quickly devolves into something called legalism and doing these things for the wrong reasons. That's what shallow religion looks like. So I want to give us a way to measure how we're doing in these areas that isn't legalistic and isn't based on shallow religion. So how can we move forward over the next 40 days or so in repentance and reflection, seeking to recalibrate our lives to God's way of living and loving others by incorporating these practices of giving and praying and fasting in such a way that isn't legalistic or empty. Here's how. We will all agree that our goal for these practices of giving and fasting and praying 
is to grow in something we're going to call self-giving love to others. Self-giving love to others is a way of saying what kind of love agape is, right? It's not to grow in knowledge. Well, that's a good thing. It's not to grow in information about Scripture. That's also a good thing. It's not even to check off uh, something to do on your daily list so that you have a sense of accomplishment. That's nice, too. Why should growing in self-giving love be our ultimate goal? Because God's core nature is love, is this kind of love. The top two commandments, right, that Jesus gave us were to love God with what? All of our heart and our mind and our soul and our strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. And the word love there is this word, agape, self, self-giving love. When self-giving love is our goal, it brings focus and clarity to our time with the Lord. It helps us to avoid some goal of like a warm fuzzy that goes away about 20 minutes or so after we say amen or shut our Bibles, right? We interact with people. All the time you're interacting with people. Which means we have hundreds, if not thousands of chances to put this kind of self-giving love into practice. And if we're going to grow in anything over the next 40 days, let's grow in self-giving love. That should be the goal of our time of giving. That should be our goal of our time of praying. That should be our goal of our time in fasting. So we're going to look at each of those areas. And the first one that Jesus mentions is giving. Giving. Jesus says, when you give to the needy. Jesus says, when you give to the needy. Jesus says, when you give to the needy. Notice that Jesus doesn't say, if you give to the needy. He says, when you give to the needy. The understanding here is that anyone who is any kind of Christ follower or a disciple of Christ or a Christian or whatever, you wanna, whatever label you want to hang on that, anyone who's trying to become like Jesus will be a giver. To be a giver means giving money or food, or clothing, or time. Givers give. Givers give whatever they have in order to share and strengthen others. Giving isn't limited only to money, but it definitely includes money. So why is giving so important to God? Because God himself is a giver. Listen. For God so loved the world that he what? gave his one and only son, John 3, 16. Your father is pleased to give you the kingdom, Luke 12, 32. How much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him? God, friends, is a giver. And he wants us to be givers too. So I want to challenge you today with something. If you have an abundance of something in your life, God has given you something that someone else needs. And your job is to channel it to where it needs to go. What do you think about that? If you have an abundance of something in your life, money, food, clothing, time, whatever, why do you have an abundance? Are you storing up nuts for the winter? Do you feel secure in knowing that you have more than you need? How much food... Do we throw out? How much money do we waste on different things? What if we approached abundance differently? What if we decided that an abundance of something is simply God giving us something that somebody else needs and he's trusting us to get it there? What an awesome privilege to be given something by God that he trusts you to channel where it's needed the most. Jesus continued, he said, but when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So Jesus is saying that the best way to be a giver is, is to be someone who gives in secret. How, how do you feel about that? Isn't part of the reward of giving to others to get some sort of credit or recognition for our generosity? 
We like to post our wins on social media, don't we? It's okay, it's human nature. We love to receive positive feedback and affirmation from other people. My dad has talked about several times that, um, that he and his family had given money to the college that he went to. And there's a plaque on one of the buildings that, you know, that this was, you know, he's part of the funding for that building. And there's bricks on the sidewalk with the Lake Wiggly name. That's the whole point of that, right? I mean, it's obvious to raise money for the university, right? But, but the whole idea of saying to somebody, hey, if you give however many dollars, you can have this brick with your name on it stuck on the sidewalk, you know, for some random 19-year-old step on as he's on his way to biology or something, right? But we do that for that recognition. Jesus doesn't condemn us. He wants to save us. Jesus wants to bring us to a place where we are f- fully secure and doing things for others in secret, knowing that our only reward comes from God. He wants us to be in this place where our inner core is so solid that, that we can do good things without needing public recognition or validation. And God recognizes and sees that we do for others in secrets. It's okay if people don't see it. Giving in secret also puts a slow death to our ego. When we give selfishly for recognition or approval, the reward is that our ego is somehow stroked, right? But when we give secretly, our ego has no fuel to burn, and our hearts and minds will increase in self-giving love to others, which is our goal, right? That self-giving love is also called agape, as I mentioned earlier in Greek. It's the kind of love that sent Jesus to the cross for you and I. So if we give in secret without recognition, what's the reward? Growing in self-giving love is a reward in and of itself. It's its own reward. And if we give to those in need, they receive a reward as of receiving from God. Through you, that's an amazing reward to everyone. Then Jesus starts talking about praying. He says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. I want to encourage you during this season of Lent to give yourself time to pray. Prayer is so important. It is the breath of the Christian life. It's how we talk to Jesus, and it need not be formal. Just speak to Jesus as if he was right in the room with you, because he is, you know. So here's a couple of things to keep in mind when you come to God in prayer. Number one, you are praying to your loving Father, not a judge. Share with him your cares and your concerns, this is number two. Share whatever is on your heart or mind. Don't hold anything back because he's a loving father, not a judge. Number three, listen. That's part of prayer, listening. What does God have to say to you? Remember, he's a loving father and not a judge. He will speak to you as a loving father. How do we know this? Because Jesus did not come to condemn you, but to save you, amen? So here's something that you need to be aware of during Lent, though. Prayer is the one thing Satan will try to disrupt more than anything else, more than any other activity. He's going to be after you on this because he knows that the more you pray, the closer that you will get to Jesus. And so prayer, it, it really becomes something that's very easy to neglect. You will find millions of excuses of why you don't have time to pray. And as we enter into Lent this evening, Try this for the next 40 days. Start with, everybody put your hand up like this. I'll wait. Okay. Um, This means five minutes. Start with five minutes. It's not very long. Five minutes. Okay. It might go longer, and that would be a good thing. But just start with five minutes. You, alone, by yourself, with God the Father, and what he sees, and he, see, when he, he sees what's done in secret, he will reward you. Me, personally, 
I pray on my drive into work. That's my alone prayer time. Lisa and I have a prayer time that we spend over coffee, but on my way into work, I pray. Sometimes for the people who are cutting me off or making me angry, but I pray. So, and then finally, Jesus gets around and starts talking about fasting. When you fast, again, it's a when, right? Not an if. When you fast, do not look somber like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they're fasting. So what is fasting? Fasting is letting go. We can fast from food or electronics, from social media, from all sorts of things, good and bad. Fasting is a way to reset and to recalibrate our lives back to God's way of living and loving. So what do you need to let go of? What is something that's causing you to be the average version of yourself or maybe something that's causing you to be the below average version of yourself? Maybe you need to let go of processed foods or artificial sweeteners or alcohol or diet sodas or, or fast food or Netflix or, no, not Netflix, or, or um, <laughs> maybe Instagram or Facebook. Maybe you need to let go of screen time altogether. When I was at Boys Town, when Lisa and I were at Boys Town, the number one thing that the kids let go of was ranch dressing and hot sauce. It seems lame, I know. But uh, this is the way I explained it to them. I'll explain it to you. When you do need to let, what you do need to let go of this, what do you need to let go of this, uh, this Lenten season? One of the most common questions that you will be asked during Lent is this. What are you giving up for Lent? That's a very common question. Most people pick a food item of sorts. If you want to fast and get the most out of this, this is what I told the kids, um, during the Lenten season, do this. Pick something that is going to be uncomfortable for you. Pick something that you will miss. For example, I am giving up Instagram. And I will miss this because I love to scroll through Instagram and see all the cute puppy posts and the, and, and the jokes and the videos that make me laugh, and I'm going to miss this. Whatever you decide to give up, it needs to be something that you will feel, that you will miss. This way, every time you find yourself missing this thing, it's an opportunity for you to stop and to pray. Even a quick prayer like this, Lord, I'm missing my Instagram time right now, but I'm so glad that I'm missing this because it reminds me of you. Thank you for going to the cross for my salvation or something like that. But every time you miss the thing, you get to spend a moment with the Lord instead. That's what Lent fasting, in my opinion, is about. And the goal of that fasting is to let go, is to break addictions, impulses, compulsions that harm ourselves. Letting go of the things that give more time and space and then taking that time and space and connecting with God. Or to offer ourselves to others in self-giving love with other people. Listen to what the book of Isaiah has to say about fasting. Is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke. To set the oppressed free and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and not to run away from your own flesh and blood. True fasting, God says in Isaiah, is offering ourselves in self-giving love to those around us. To the oppressed to the hungry, to the wanderer, to the naked, and even to our own flesh and blood. That means our family, right? So I'm going to conclude with this. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God does not condemn us. He wants to save us. Lent is a time for us to assess ourselves and to make adjustments back to the way that God wants us to live and to love others. So will you make it a practice during this Lent season in your giving and your praying and your fasting over the next 40 days with the goal to be to grow in this kind of self-giving love? The goal is not to do these spiritual exercises so that you can check them off of some kind of a heavenly to-do list, right? But it's growing in self-giving love. That's what God really cares about. He's not keeping score. He's working 
to transform us, to change our hearts and our minds into the likeness of his son. Metanoia, right? We get to participate in that transformation, that metanoia. So Jesus, he came to save us from this shallow kind of religion. So let's receive his love and his goodness and let him wash our hearts and our minds this time, this Lenten season. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time today. For this time when we can come and we can spend at the start of our Lenten season. Lord, we have 40 days to hit the reset button, to recalibrate our lives, to focus our attention and our thoughts and our hearts and our minds on you. And Lord, when we give and when we pray and when we fast, let's keep this between you and each of us. Help us, Lord, to spend this time together over these next days and weeks, growing in our love and sharing that love with each other and with this community. Because, Lord, you have a transformation in mind, not just for, for me, not just for each person sitting here, but you want to transform this church, Lord. You want to transform this community, Lord. And the way that gets done is when we learn together how to love others in this self-giving way. And we pray for that, Lord. We pray that this, this season of, of Lent would be a time of renewal for each of us and for Lighthouse. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.